I'm Jose Rosario. I am a recent graduate of Rhode Island College. It's still a little weird to say that. Thank you. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the power of words because it's something that we do every day, but we never really think about the impact that we have on the people around us. I'm a firm believer that even a smile can go a long way. Anyone around here will tell you that I'll smile at you randomly in the hallway. You'll never know who I am, but it'll make you smile, and that's kind of the goal. So my story begins back in 1995, not too, too long ago, um, in Hartford, Connecticut. I decided that I wanted to decide when I would be born, not my parents, not the doctors. I'm very stubborn, as my mom will tell you. Uh, so I was born very, very early, and that came with some consequences. So I was born three months early, before the period of viability, so no one really knew kind of what was next for me. I was two pounds, one ounce the day I was born. The next day I went down to one pound, zero ounces. So not too far from where I am right now, but you know. <laughs> that was soon followed by a four month struggle in a hospital where I stayed in an incubator and could not be held by my parents, my grandparents. I didn't get to meet my family until I went home. And it felt like an eternity to my parents. And sometimes when they talk about it, I can still hear that sort of longing they had. So when I finally went home, it really wasn't the kind of story that you typically expect. When you hear about a homecoming, you think of bringing your baby boy or baby girl home and being excited and getting to introduce him to the family and pass them around. With me, I was still so fragile that all they could do was bring me home and place me in my crib. My parents were afraid to hold me. In fact, it took my dad months after I got home to even give me a bottle because he was so terrified. I don't blame him, I think I would be too, but that is my life. Um, a week later, my life changed in a way that no one expected. My mom was in the shower, and over the baby monitor, she heard a gasp, and no one wants to hear that, that's terrifying. So she runs out and finds me in my crib, blue in the face. She, doesn't, she didn't know what was going on, and all she did was start screaming for my family that was in the house. Soon enough, we were in an ambulance, and it was 11 minutes and 54 seconds later that I was still not breathing. I had made it to the ER and the doctors were ready to give up. In fact, my mom says they did give up. They told her, I think it might be time to say goodbye. And all of a sudden, they heard a cry, and here I was. <laughs> so when the brain loses oxygen, it does cause some neurological damage. I developed a disability called cerebral palsy that affects the brain in different capacities for every individual, which is something I soon learned. So I went to elementary school, and this was around the time where we were really trying to be inclusive and include students with disabilities in every classroom. So that wasn't always easy. In fact, we had to fight. I remember being in elementary school, and I'm going to tell you a little story about elementary school that does not involve glue, does not involve crayons, but it involves my mom having to fight for a wheelchair. I was in a first grade classroom and they told my mom they could not provide a wheelchair for me. So instead of being able to move around and engage with my peers, I had to crawl everywhere. So there was a door that led out to recess, out to the playground. Boy, I wish we still had a recess, but nonetheless, <laughs> one day that door was left open and a stray cat came in and the cat followed me around because I was on the floor. What was this human doing on the floor? <laughs> and everyone thought it was fine and everyone started laughing. It wasn't until the kids started teasing me and calling me cat boy that no one realized what was wrong. I don't remember this day, but my mom told me that I came home in tears and that the first thing I said to her was, why couldn't I be like anyone else? And I remember that my mom fought, and I got my wheelchair. She fought, and she fought for years. My mom has always been my champion. But that's not what you expect when your kid's going into first grade. That's not the kind of story that you build up in your head when you find out you're expecting. So that sort of theme of I'm different stuck with me throughout many years. In fact, all throughout elementary school, most of the time, you would find me in my closet crying, asking my mom, why couldn't I jump on the trampoline or why couldn't I run the race like all of my other friends? So I struggled with that and it was definitely a difficult time in my life. So it didn't just happen at school and this is where my story really took a turn in a way that I hope I never have to see for anyone else. 
I was in a doctor's appointment, and a doctor told my mom, he's not going to amount to anything. He's going to be a vegetable. This isn't the kind of life he needs. You really should consider just giving up. He really doesn't need anything else. There isn't anything we can do for him. So I was six years old at the time when I heard that story. Right in front of me, they told me I wasn't going to be anything. And I believed them. Everything inside of me felt like it shattered. I didn't want to do anything anymore. I didn't want to fight. Because if they didn't believe in me and they were the doctors, then why would I? And it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. I gave up. I didn't do anything. I didn't care. Because why should I? I was broken. My self-esteem was definitely, definitely at an all-time low. And then the teenage years happen. And everyone knows it's great to be a teenager. <laughs> well, unfortunately, my extended family didn't understand disability. And in some ways, they resented me for wanting to try to live a different life. And I grew up being told horrendous things by members of my family. You're ugly. You're not going to do anything. I don't understand why you try. To the point where for three years of my teenage life, I refused to look in a mirror. Anytime there was a reflective surface, I would turn away. And to be honest with you, you guys are the first ones to hear that because my family doesn't even know that. But the impact of those words were so deep that I could not function. I just couldn't be the person everyone wanted me to be. But one thing I did learn quite early on was being able to put on a mask and smile and wave and pretend everything is okay. And I did have some friends and family that really did care, but it didn't feel that way. I was already so destroyed by everything I had heard that there wasn't much more I could do. Well, I smiled and waved, and apparently I got some attention. I started talking to people and really wanting to help others, because I realized that if I helped others, I didn't have to help myself. If I focused on everyone else, then everything else fell to the wayside. So I got involved in a group called SAD. It, was, it stands for Students Against Destructive Decisions, and it was all about anti-bullying, anti-self-harm, drugs and alcohol, and I really, really got involved. Like everything I do, it's either zero or a hundred for me. I, there's no in-between. I am dedicated to everything I do. And I worked hard, and next thing you know, members of the city council came to me and offered me a job as Rhode Island's first youth intervention consultant at the age of 13. Thank you. So I, th I thought that was great. You know, I would get to travel and get to talk to students and really help young people. But all the while, I didn't really know what I was getting into. One day I heard a story, and it stuck with me to this day, of a mom who lost her son due to a drunk driver. Her son was left on the side of the road, and no one tried to help him. And she knows that if they would have, her son would have been okay. This isn't the first time I had heard that story. But this story stuck to me because the mom cried on my shoulder. And she tried to give me a check. And I was very confused. What are, what are you doing? And she said to me, I believe in you, and I believe in what you're doing. She then handed me a book, and inside that book was her son Stephen's poem. And Stephen wrote a poem called, I am a shaper of destiny. And those words stuck with me. In fact, she even gave me a bookmark that had those words written on them. And I thought about that for a while. And I thought, wow, we are shaping lives by doing what we do. By all of you being here, we are shaping lives. We have a responsibility to the people around us. But yet, I still wasn't ready to talk about what I needed. So before I get into what's happening now, I need to kind of transition you into what happened to get me here. After all of this happened, I came to college. The summer of college, things got really bad. I hadn't dealt with my anxiety or my depression, and I wasn't in a state of mind where I was ready to help people. And I didn't know that until during my freshman year, we had our winter break. And at that moment, I thought, why am I even here? What is the point of being here? And that was the first time I had contemplated ending my life. It's not a story I tell people because everyone thinks cheery and happy Jose has always been here, but it was because I was so ready and so able to put on that mask. And it was at that moment that I realized I needed to do something different. And I started working on myself. 
started working on what I needed for the first time and distancing myself from people that I knew weren't right for me. So here we are now, 2017. Last Saturday, I graduated with two bachelors, one in psychology and one in chemical dependency. Thank you. And in the fall, I began a dual master's program in clinical psychology and public policy. So they're not getting rid of me that easy. <laughs> so during my time here, I got really involved because after everything kind of fell into place and I started taking care of myself, I felt different. There was a light about me and I was actually ready to make change in a different way that I wasn't prepared for before. I was ready to tell my story to people that needed it. I was ready to connect. And I got involved in student organizations, advocacy and beyond, the student advocacy group for people with disabilities, and that was an amazing experience. It was my first time being a leader, and my first time kind of labeling myself as a person with a disability and being proud of that, and I hadn't done that in a while. I joined Phi Mu Delta fraternity. Yes, I am a fraternity man. <laughs> it was one of the biggest blessings I could have had. During my interview with Phi Mu Delta, they said to me, we just want to know who you are. We don't want to know what your story is beyond you know, what you want to tell us. We want you to tell us who you want us to know. And that was the first time that I realized people want to know Jose. You don't want the sunshiny disposition. You don't want the mask. You want more than that. And these men took me in and really helped me grow. They've sent me all over the country and I've been able to help a lot of young people through this role. And then this year happened. My senior year, I thought I was gonna be a slacker, guys. Apparently I'm not. <laughs> I joined Student Community Government Incorporated as the new president. So in that role, I supervised over 90 student organizations and their funding and helped student organizations grow and prosper on campus. I've also had the amazing opportunity to work with administration and faculty and staff to really create some policies on campus about inclusive excellence. And that's a term you heard earlier, so bring it all full circle. <laughs> One thing we did was talk about snow removal on campus, because this can't get through the snow. <laughs> we also talked about gender-inclusive restrooms. We talked about female hygiene products in the bathrooms. Anything that students needed, we were ready. And I totally credit my story and my time now to who I was before. I've also gotten involved in state politics. In fact, the picture you see on the screen is a picture of myself with the governor and the Democratic National Convention chairman. He was here last uh, month and we were talking about affordable education. So I consider myself a pioneer for the rights of students and young people all across the country. So what have I learned? I've learned that our words have power, that we have to make a choice every day about how we're going to shape the lives of those around us. We have to make a choice if we're going to be the positive force or the people that bring them down. And I, my biggest fear in my line of work is that I will never be that positive force. But I realized actually pretty recently that if you care, wholeheartedly care about people and about connecting, you can never fail. I've learned that we have to define ourselves. No one else can do that for us. People had defined me as a lost cause, as a failure, as a bad son, whatever you want to call it. But I've defined myself as a leader and as someone who wants to make change, who wants to leave the world and leave an impact behind. I've also learned that it's important to show respect. And that's not something we think about when we're speaking. I've been called confined to a wheelchair or the handicapped when really what they should be doing is recognizing the person in the wheelchair. So that is why I wanted to include this, talking about people with disabilities, people with addiction, people with bipolar disorder. It is about defining us as people before anything else. And the last thing that I wanna say about what I've learned and I have a feeling that this is gonna resonate with a lot of people in the audience. Social justice and inclusion are not just buzzwords. We don't just use them and say that we've done our job. Our job is to actually build a community together. 
And we haven't done that yet as a country, and we are working on it. One thing that I am so grateful about Rhode Island College is that I've built my community here, and we're still building. And now you're all here, and we're building something too. Today, I want you guys to realize that when I was in the audience last year, I cried because this is a special moment. Continue to build that together. So what's next for me? I'm a young clinician, still learning the ropes, going to grad school, but I've decided that I also want to do policy work, that I'm not done and I'm not satisfied with just what I've already accomplished. It needs to grow. I need to go beyond Rhode Island. I want to be a voice to be someone that people can count on, and that is my goal. I want to focus on marginalized populations. People tell me all the time, Jose, you can check every box, or even worse, they tell me, you're everything our new president hates. It's not a box, it's not one trait, but we need to empower people to speak up. And that is why, recently, I started my own website. ThePhoenixEmpowered.com is a place where I have been writing, and it's very new, so bear with me, <laughs> but I have been writing and chronicling my story, but also asking people to submit their stories so that we can create a community that will span across our country, across the world. I want to build a place where people understand it's okay to share your story. It's okay to take the mask off. It's okay to just be you. So I want to thank you humbly for listening to me, and I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you.